Hello ladies and gentlemen. The topic of this discussion is eclampsia. Now eclampsia is the most feared complication of preeclampsia. And so if you haven't watched my video on preeclampsia yet, I would suggest that you watch that video before watching this one. And the reason is I'm going to assume that you have some idea, some knowledge of what preeclampsia is. Most women who develop eclampsia will have a previously established diagnosis of preeclampsia. There's some nuances to that, and we'll talk about that. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to my Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash pwbmd. You can do that by typing that into your browser or by clicking the link below, which I put in the description of the video, or by clicking the little I button on the upper right hand corner of your screen. It should link you up to my page. Just chip in a dollar a month. A little bit goes a long ways. You'll have access to my premium review videos, which are case studies, and those case studies will really help you if you're studying for step two or step three with those clinical case scenarios. Uh, go through sort of a case review and then uh, figure out differential, what labs should be ordered, and then uh, go from there and do some review of what is actually going on in that patient. So it should be useful to you for that purpose and you'll have access to that by just donating a dollar a month. Thank you very much in advance. So eclampsia sits on the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Many of these things are more or less non-consequential. They're very common. But once you start getting into preeclampsia, and especially eclampsia and HELP syndrome, you have some major, major risks of complications, both for mom and for baby. Now, pregnant women with a blood pressure higher than 140 over 90, there is something pathologic going on, whether or not that's before 20 weeks or after 20 weeks, you want to know. And then you want to know whether or not there's proteinuria. And so some of those diagnoses for hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, what it actually is, is going to depend on when it's diagnosed and whether or not there's proteinuria. The risk factors for eclampsia are virtually the same as the risk factors for preeclampsia. So we talked about this in the preeclampsia section, but those risk factors include nulliparity. So if a woman has a pregnancy and she does not have preeclampsia, then her risk of developing preeclampsia in subsequent pregnancies actually goes down. Now, the caveat to that is that it's got to be the same father. If she has a pregnancy, doesn't have preeclampsia, but then she has another pregnancy, but it's a new father, her risk of developing preeclampsia would be as if she had not ever been pregnant before. So it's nulliparity uh, with the particular father. And that suggests possibly some kind of an immune pathogenesis. Extremes of age, so we're talking about teenage moms and moms of advanced gestational age, uh, so beyond 35 multiple gestation, and then a past medical history of chronic hypertension. Possibly a majority of women who have chronic hypertension go on to develop preeclampsia. Diabetes, renal disease, systemic lupus. What do these all have in common? They're all small vessel diseases. This is interesting. Family history. If the mother of the father of the baby had preeclampsia in her pregnancies, then this woman is at increased risk. So there may be some paternal factor going on. Parental ethnic discordance, so if mom is black, dad is white, there's an increased risk there. And then African Americans appear to be at a higher rate of preeclampsia than uh, other races. So these ones I put in red here contribute to the idea that this is an, an immune process. But there are multiple different theories, and the mechanisms that have been suggested are very complex, and you're by no means responsible for knowing that for the test. So eclampsia is the onset of seizures in a woman with preeclampsia. For the USMLE, that's what you need to know. Now, in practice, the woman may not already be diagnosed with preeclampsia. So let's say that you check a woman at 32 weeks, and she, her urine came back fine, she wasn't hypertensive, no diagnosis of preeclampsia. Now at 34 weeks, she comes in and she's seizing. Well, it could very well be that she developed preeclampsia at some point in between then, let's say at 33 weeks, 
and now she's developed eclampsia. Remember, you can develop preeclampsia anytime after 20 weeks, and you can even develop it after birth. So I think that a lot of those cases where they say uh, the woman developed eclampsia without having preeclampsia, a lot of those may be just that the preeclampsia had not been diagnosed. Uh, but there are women who do develop eclampsia who don't have proteinuria. So that's interesting. 75% of women who develop eclampsia will have had severe preeclampsia. So not only having the proteinuria and the hypertension, but also having uh, one of those severe signs. So something like pulmonary edema, or right upper quadrant pain, or hemolytic anemia, or thrombocytopenia. Or maybe they have the severe headaches or visual changes. Or maybe they have the really severe hypertension, over 160 over 110, for instance. So any of those severe signs, which we talked about in the preeclampsia, that distinguish severe preeclampsia from mild preeclampsia, the vast majority of women who develop eclampsia will have had severe preeclampsia, but about a quarter will have only mild preeclampsia or may not have diagnosed preeclampsia at all. 50% of seizures will occur during labor. You can imagine that's got to be pretty problematic because now not only are you tending to a delivery, but you're also tending towards uh, a a seizure that you need to stabilize. 25% occurred before labor and 25% occur after labor and that's important too because that's going to uh, affect our management of eclampsia and also affects our management of preeclampsia as well. The incidence of eclampsia is about 1 in 2 to 3,000 pregnancies in the Western world obviously a substantially lower incidence than with preeclampsia. Most women with preeclampsia don't go on to develop eclampsia. The maternal mortality is nearly 1 in 50. The fetal mortality is about 1 in 14, so nothing to shake a stick at by any means. The clinical manifestations of eclampsia, you're going to have a woman with preeclampsia typically, so maternal hypertension, proteinuria, and then seizures. And seizures are necessary manifestation to make the diagnosis of eclampsia. You don't have eclampsia without seizures. And any time you have a woman who is towards the end of her pregnancy or just after her pregnancy who has seizures, the very first thing on your mind should be eclampsia. Now, is it possible that a woman has epilepsy and is pregnant and develops a seizure? Absolutely. But with eclampsia, you're talking about a seizure in a woman with no history of previous seizures. There may or may not be coexisting systemic abnormalities. Those would be your severe signs. The ones that you really want to look out for, I mean, there's a lot of signs that would confer a diagnosis of severe preeclampsia, but the ones you really want to look out for are headache and visual disturbances because that suggests some level of cerebral edema, which we know is uh, part of the cause of eclamptic seizures. Fetal manifestations of eclampsia as well as preeclampsia include intrauterine growth retardation, oligohydramnios or reduced amniotic fluid, and abnormal fetal oxygenation. The in incidence of symptoms that precede an eclamptic seizure have been delineated, and the ones that are most commonly associated with the future development of an eclamptic seizure are headache and hyperactive reflexes. So really look for a headache. Headache may be sort of a prodromal symptom that later she's going to develop eclampsia. 83% of women who go on to develop eclampsia will say that they've had a headache uh, in the days leading up to the seizure. Hyperactive reflexes is another one. And then also marked proteinuria, generalized edema, visual disturbances, and right upper quadrant or epigastric pain. So the consequences of seizure during pregnancy and delivery include maternal acidosis, maternal and fetal hypoxia, CNS damage and trauma, including hemorrhage. Now, this is interesting. There's a question, controversy, as to whether or not a woman having an eclamptic seizure has any long-term ramifications on her future health. And one study has shown that Eclamptic seizures are associated with permanent white matter lesions, which may lead to lasting psychological or cognitive effects. But that hasn't been proven by any means, that's just in some of the literature. 
An eclamptic seizure is associated with about a 20 to 50 percent risk of abrupt placenta. So do you think, let's say you have a 34-year-old, or sorry, a 34-week gestation woman, she's at 34 weeks, she comes in, she has a seizure, she's got a history of preeclampsia, so we know we have a diagnosis of eclampsia. Do you think we're going to send her home? No, we're not going to send her home. This woman is going to be delivered during this visit. Now, how long we wait is questionable, but more than likely this baby is going to be coming out very soon. The classic presentation of eclampsia is a convulsive seizure in a woman in late pregnancy or within a few weeks of delivery. It may be preceded by a headache and visual changes, but it may not. Past labs or a history consistent with preeclampsia and or the existence of edema are highly suggestive. So all that's saying is that you want to look in her past history, look at her previous labs. If she's had preeclampsia, then this seizure is more than likely eclampsia. But anytime you have a woman who is in her third trimester of pregnancy or just after she delivers and she has a seizure, eclampsia has to be number one on your differential. Could it be an epileptic seizure from having epilepsy? Sure, but we uh, eclampsia is going to be the, the path of least resistance. It's the most likely. Uh, it, it fits most properly. Uh, but I just want to put that into perspective there. So the management for eclampsia is going to be stabilize, stabilize, stabilize. You are not going to deliver a woman who is seizing. Okay, so the very first thing we want to do is tend to her ABCs. We want to get her 100% oxygen via face mask. Why do we do that? Because she may not be breathing properly and we want to make sure that she's getting oxygen not only to oxygenate her but to also provide oxygen to the baby. We also want to start an IV line. That's mostly because we're going to be giving her IV medications. We want to get a Foley catheter in her and that's not only to monitor her I's and O's but also to get urine and to check and make sure that she indeed does have preeclampsia but it's mostly to monitor her I's and O's. Uh, remember that there can be volume issues with, uh, with preeclampsia, eclampsia. We also want to get an EKG. Why? Because we're going to be pumping her up with magnesium and that can cause issues with cardiac conduction. So seizure control, and I will say, a lot of this stuff you're going to be kind of doing all at the same time, uh, but I, I separate them here just so you get a mental picture. So seizure control, what do we use? This is important because you're going to be given a test question where you have a woman with preeclampsia, now she's having seizures, what do we give to abort her seizure? And this is important because this is sort of the cornerstone of management in eclampsia, is aborting the seizure. Now, in just your average Joe Q public, you might think, well, we're going to give her Ativan, or we're going to give her Valium, or something like that, a benzodiazepine to abort the seizure. And that would be very, very fine if she didn't have eclampsia. With eclampsia, the best medication that you can give to abort the seizure is magnesium sulfate. You can give her four to six grams of magnesium sulfate in her IV, and that is the best drug to abort an eclamptic seizure. Okay, so magnesium sulfate is the first line agent. Now, if she doesn't respond to magnesium sulfate, then and only then can you consider giving her Ativan or Valium. Okay, benzodiazepines are second line agents, as well as phenytoin, are second line agents. Uh, and they're only for patients who don't respond to magnesium sulfate. Okay, so very important that you, you know that. Now, 10% of women, after you give them magnesium, they come out of the seizure. 10% uh, of women will uh, have a subsequent seizure. In those women, you'll give them magnesium sulfate again. So benzodiazepines are only given if you give them magnesium and it, it fails to abort the seizure. But if they have a subsequent seizure, then you're going to give them magnesium again, like a 2-gram bolus, and 
uh, try to abort the seizure that way. Magnesium sulfate, best drug for eclamptic seizures. You also want to control any severe hypertension, so anything above 160 or over 110 diastolic. The goal is between 140 to 160 over between 90 to 110. You don't want to go too low because if you drop her blood pressure too, too low or too rapidly, it can result in inadequate uteroplacental perfusion and that can result in fetal compromise. So typically the drugs we go to here are hydralazine or labetalol. And this is given again IV and this is to control hypertension. And meanwhile, while you're doing all of this, you should be starting cardi cardio tachometry to monitor and assess fetal well-being. You may and often will see transient fetal bradycardia following the seizure, uh, and that can last several minutes. This is not an indication to do an emergent C-section. This is a normal response uh, to the seizure. So just going back here, why do we not why do we want to avoid benzodiazepines at all costs? Well, it is pregnancy class D, but what results from giving benzodiazepines? It crosses the placenta, goes into the fetus, and you're at risk of after that baby's born of having CNS and respiratory depression. So that's why we want to avoid giving benzodiazepines. Now, if this were just like I said, any anybody else, yeah, we would go straight to benzodiazepines. Uh, but uh, magnesium sulfate is the drug of choice for eclamptic seizures. You will get a question on that. I can almost guarantee you if you get a, an eclampsia question, that's going to be what it's asking you for is what drug do we give, and that's magnesium sulfate. So the definitive management is delivery, but only after the patient has been stabilized. And by stabilized here, we mean aborting the seizure, and controlling the hypertension. Do you have to do a C-section? No, not necessarily. You can try to deliver the baby vaginally, uh, but you need to get that baby out. Now, if she's less than 32 weeks, you'll give betamethasone. You want her to be NPO just in case you need to do a, an operative delivery. In case you need to do a C-section, then uh, you want her to be NPO. Uh, because there's such a high risk, that's ideal, that she doesn't have anything in her stomach. And then you want to notify anesthesia. Okay, so they can give their typical uh, spinals and epidurals and all that stuff, but you'll want to notify them right away because in the event that you do need to do a C-section suddenly, they need to have that, uh, that block already on board. Uh, so they'll, and you'll, you'll want them to be aware as well that this is an eclamptic patient. This isn't just your garden variety woman who's coming in for induction. So the postpartum management. This is very important too. And I could see a board question on this. So magnesium sulfate should be continued through at least the first day after delivery in women with severe preeclampsia and eclampsia. Why? Because you're not out of the woods yet. Remember that preeclampsia and eclampsia, by extension, are not just disorders of pregnancy, but they're also disorders of the porperium, or the period of time uh, during and after delivery. So even though she's delivered the baby, delivered the placenta, she's still in a semi-pregnant state. I mean, that's why we consider that uh, the fourth stage of labor. Uh, so, this is very important that you continue the magnesium sulfate for the first 12 to 24 hours after delivery in women with severe preeclampsia and eclampsia. Postpartum seizures should be managed with magnesium sulfate. Again here. So even though we're not worried, in this case, about giving, uh, giving benzodiazepines and the benzodiazepines crossing the placenta and causing respiratory depression in the newborn, it still holds that this is an eclamptic seizure and the best drug to give an eclamptic seizure is magnesium sulfate. And you'll want to continue that magnesium sulfate an additional 24 hours beyond that seizure. Okay, so what I want you to take from this is that you're not out of the woods once that baby is delivered. There is still some postpartum management uh, that needs to be considered. And so we can continue the magnesium sulfate uh, 24 hours after delivery 
And then if she does have a seizure, we bolus her with magnesium sulfate to try to abort the seizure. Just a few more concluding points on eclampsia. As many as 56% of patients with eclampsia may have transient deficits, including cortical blindness. What we know about eclampsia is that that cerebral edema that develops, that leads to the seizures, a lot of that edema is in the occipital lobe. And so that's why you see those visual changes. And so having some edema back there can lead to cortical uh, changes in vision, uh, which can be as bad as cortical blindness. Uh, so as many as 56% will have transient deficits, uh, and, and much of that is due to the cerebral edema and can include things like cortical blindness. But this does not last. This is transient. The studies have failed to demonstrate the ex existence of persistent neurologic deficits after uncomplicated eclamptic seizures during the follow-up period. Now, certainly, if she had an eclamptic seizure and she developed a, an intracranial bleed, for instance, well, then certainly there can be uh, some long-lasting CNS damage. Some studies have suggested that women who have eclampsia have an increased risk for strokes and coronary artery disease later in life, but that's not very well studied. And then the maternal death rate is about 0 to 1.8 percent. Uh, in the U.S. and U.K., the perinatal mortality rate is between 5.6 and 11.8 percent. Uh, and this is a slightly newer figure, uh, but is a lot in line with that earlier statistic I gave you, uh, which was around about 1 in 7, 1 in 8. Uh, the mortality rate, both for mom and for baby, is higher in developing countries. So that is something uh, to keep in mind. What that probably points to is that the quality of care is really going to improve uh, the outcomes both for mom and for baby. And with that, if you have any questions, write me a note below. Otherwise, I will see you next time.